conversation with the candidate continues. Thank you for clicking on our extended digital conversation with the candidate. With the candidate this week, Governor Steve Bullock of Montana. We're going to jump right back into our questions with our crack team of New Hampshire voters. We're going to start with Kathleen Hoey. Hi, Governor. Welcome to New Hampshire. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, so I'm going to ask you something that you've actually already addressed a little bit, um, but I would like to know as president, how would you address the high cost of prescription drugs so that people can get the treatment they need rather than sacrificing their basic needs? No, and Kathleen, I don't know if it's a challenge for you. It's a challenge for people that I meet all over both my state and the country. Yes. And you shouldn't have to choose between heating your house or paying for your prescription drugs. And we've gotten this system where, and I do think part of it, and I've had a decade long fight against this post Citizens United world of what's happened where decisions are made in Washington, D.C. more at the donor's request than really at the request of reflecting what the people are asking for. And I think we got to change that. I mean, that's holding us back in so many of the areas that we'll be talking about um, today. But first, the ability to negotiate drug prices, right? So the federal government is the biggest purchaser of prescription drugs in the entire country between Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And once you can't even set a price by the market because you have pulled the federal government out of it, it's going to keep prices inflatedly high. I think another thing that you could do is actually, and at times you need to bring, as a former attorney general, consumer protection actions for price fixing. You need to get generics onto the market faster. There's some discussion about importation importation from other mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. I would consider that, but first I want these actors, these drug companies, to start actually playing by the rules and giving us a fair shake before. And I believe it can be done. Part of it's gonna be the executive action, what you can do through your Department of Justice. Part of it is, like, I have never met anybody while I've been out campaigning that doesn't say either, well, there's just not enough money in politics, right? Mm -hmm. Or that, uh, these drug companies who are now spending more on advertising even than they are for research and development mm -hmm. that they're giving us a fair shake. Mm -hmm. I think this ought to be a place where we can get both Democrats and Republicans to move positively forward on that to finally really meaningfully impact mm -hmm. drug crisis. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathy. Next question comes from Laura Landerman-Garber. Hi there. Hi, Laura. Welcome to New Hampshire. It is great to be in New Hampshire. Montana's, it's beautiful. oh, my necklace? Uh, yeah, Thank it's a beautiful you. necklace. I got it in Italy. Oh, is that right? Thank you very much. Montana's on my bucket list, so um, maybe afterwards you can give us a few uh, tips on I'll where to go. I'll have you stop by the Capitol and say, <laughs> I hey. would love that. That'd yeah. be great. Remember me from WMUR? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on a more serious note, um, I'm just horrified, as the nation is, I, I, I believe, of the staggering suicide rates amongst our veterans as well as our active uh, military personnel. It's 20 plus a day on most reports. As president, what message would you give to our national heroes and our service yeah. families? And also maybe even more importantly, what plans do you have for this national crisis? No. Thank you, Laura. And it Thank is a national crisis. Um, I am also, as governor, you are commander in chief of the National Guard. Like I've sent young men and women on their fourth deployment. I've gone to Afghanistan and Kuwait to visit our soldiers. I've had nine deaths of soldiers in my six years. Every one of them was by suicide. Every single one of them. And um, here's what I've done in Montana first. And look, when people make a commitment to serve our country, we have to have reciprocal commitment that we're going to take care of their health, physical, and mental when they return or when they're in active duty, that they'll have an opportunity for a job. Montana is second in the nation for uh, the number of veterans and their families. So the first thing I did when I started seeing more suicides in our National Guard is I opened up the Employee Assistance Program, so sort of the state mental health to not only Guard members, but their entire families. And then what I saw is, you know what, there are veterans 
people that have served in uniform that don't even have access to VA services. So in the state of Montana, I said, if you've ever worn a uniform for even two days, you can get this mental health services and counseling through our state program. We've turned around and said, uh, we actually uh, partnered with our broadcaster association to make evidence-based public service announcements saying you'd never leave a soldier on the field and you as a fellow soldier or airman have an obligation to keep your buddy if you see any of the signs of suicide. We've got to recognize that, and like when we expanded Medicaid expansion in Montana is one example. 100,000 people got health care, 10,000 of them were veterans and their families. Base health care and mental health access has got to be part of it, and that's what I would do as president. Making the awareness of trying to get rid of the stigma of getting help is something that I would do as part of the process. I mean, this has been one, and it's not just our veteran suicide, teen suicide. The suicide that I've had in, um, with our Native American, our Indian nations. It's something that haunts me as governor, and it should haunt all of us as we're losing folks. Getting access to mental health, getting rid of the stigma, making sure that there can be the anonymity anonymity in seeking it so you don't think you might lose your opportunity for further promotion. It's all things that we've done in Montana and I think it needs to go to scale nationally. As a psychologist myself, uh, working with teens and many military families, I appreciate that. I think uh, mental health accessibility is a, also a national crisis, especially for minorities. It, it, it is. It is. And it's something that like on, not just with the veterans, Laura, I mean, we've gotten money, and we're also on the veterans part of an overall, like we were one of six states chosen to say, how do we meaningfully address this? But for our kids, you can't wait until they're junior in high school. Like we're putting in resiliency programs from the time they enter, like good behavior games. It all ought to be evidence-based, making these investments for the long term that's going to give kids the resiliency to address and deal with many of life's challenges that we have right now. But thank you for the work that you do on this thank too, you. Laura. Yeah. Quick follow up on that, Governor. Uh, as a former Attorney General, you're well aware that uh, any ambitious uh, gun control measure could certainly go to the Supreme Court and be struck down under the Second Amendment. So how much more important is that mental health component to resolving our issue of mass shootings in the event that, say you did pass something ambitious in terms of guns, that that could be uh, struck down by the Supreme yeah, Court? Yeah, and I don't, I don't think, um, I mean, the answer to trying to keep our communities and our families safe isn't all mental health. I mean, I've lowered the flags five times since Parkland due to mass shootings. A quarter of the times that have been asked by either President Trump or President Obama to lower the flags were for mass shootings. I think of my son, my youngest, uh, went, started a new school this year, sixth grade. And I'm like, Cam, what did you learn? after the first week. He's like, I know where to go in case of an active shooter. No kid should have to go through that. If we actually looked at this as a public health issue, not as a political issue, a public health issue would turn around and say, we need to get universal background checks. Everybody ought to get checked before they can purchase a weapon. And you know what? The majority of Republicans and NRA members agree to that. You turn around and say, red flag laws, the ability to remove a gun at a time, or you know that where there's an order of protection, domestic violence, the incidence of death if there's a gun in the household goes up so much more. I think that there are steps if we look at this as how could you address it to meaningfully impact folks' lives from a public health issue. That's why we have seat belts. Right? At some point in life, they said, enough of this. I think growing up, though, and I'm also, I'm a hunter. Um, I own rifles. I hunt with my son. Growing up, the NRA was a gun safety and a hunter's education organization. Now it's nothing more than a political organization. Trying to further divide and trying to divide people when it comes to the Second Amendment. I've supported the Second Amendment. I've also vetoed a whole bunch of bills that I didn't think made sense for our 
communities or states, like things like, and I say this in New Hampshire, but like having guns in schools doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense to me. Or areas like that are getting rid of all ability to enforce federal laws. So directly to your question, Adam, I think that we do have to address mental health. But I think that just to say that how we're going to keep our communities and our families safe is mental health and not addressing some of what I'll say is the public health issues of gun safety, I think that's a cop out. Next question comes from Joan Krimlisk. Well, <coughs> welcome. It's great to be here, Joan. Okay. Um, I have yet another health care question, oh, good. but um, from hopefully a different perspective. Of perhaps um, how can Medicare be expanded and funded for individuals under 65 um, or another public affordable option implemented um, for individuals working with um, for-profit health insurance companies as well as non-profit yeah. health insurance companies. No, I, and thank you. And part of that I started to address up front because I think that this is part of the opportunity to really create competition and the availability for greater access. You know, that when you have 156 million people, 70% have an employer-sponsored health care. Like maybe if you were starting from a new, if you were building a system that didn't exist, you'd turn around, at least in my perspective, and you'd make it a Medicare for all system. But given what we have, how do we actually improve without fundamentally disrupting people's lives? I think what you're speaking of is exactly what we need. And that's a public option buy-in so that someone can go out on the marketplace and say, well, this insurance company is going to charge me this much, but I can actually buy in cheaper level from what the federal government would afford. And then what you could do is begin to lower the Medicare age eligibility over time, which gets you more and more to the point where you might have a single payer program. But doing something like that, and that's where we build off of what we've done, I think is gonna afford us an opportunity for both the federal government and then private companies to play a role in ensuring that everybody has accessible and affordable health care. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Joan. Next question comes from Carolyn Morrill. Hi, hey, welcome. Hey, Carolyn. Um, in Montana, you were able to get many programs such as your health care passed with a Republican majority in your legislation. In Washington, D.C., it is my party's way or no way. Do you think you can o overcome their arrogance and get something accomplished? And, and, <laughs> and I do. I mean, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't. Like, let me give you an example of how I got uh, Medicaid expansion passed the first time. Never forget, I went to this town called Shoto, Montana. 1,700 people. This is in 2015. The heart of the anti-Obamacare time. Everybody in Shoto knew why I was going to be there because the Koch brothers were nice enough to mail pictures with me and Barack Obama right next to it and saying, bullocks come to your community to destroy your health care system. But I showed up anyway. Instead of telling them everything they needed, I listened. First person that spoke said, 43% of the people that walk through these hospital doors don't have health insurance. A couple other people got up, spoke about maybe, you know, that I was a socialist or something. But then the third person that spoke was the chair of the county commission. He wasn't even from Shoto. He was a rancher from Bynum, population 50. And he said to me, you know what? I was born in this hospital. This hospital saved my life two years ago when I had a heart attack. And if we lose this hospital, this town's gone. Most people... Their lives aren't about the dysfunction in our politics. Everybody wants a safe community, a decent job, good public schools, clean air, clean water, the belief you can do better for your kids and grandkids than yourself. I think how you can break some of this is by recognizing that, that the values, the things that people want, aren't that far apart. To go to the Shotos all across this country, not just make it about Washington, D.C. I do believe we can break this dysfunction. It's not going to be easy. I've seen it done in Montana. I think we can do it elsewhere, but I also think that there's another part of this that when you turn around and say, you know, like tax cuts are being written when a sen U.S. senator says, we've got to do this to make our donors happy, when 44% of Americans wouldn't have 400 bucks in their pocket in case of emergency, or oil companies are making record profits while Republicans can't even acknowledge that the climate crisis is real. That as we do this, we also got to address what's happening with this corrupting influence of outside money, and that'll help make D.C. work 
that much better too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Quick follow on the health care issue. Please. Governor. Uh, Medicaid expansion helps with rural health care, but it's certainly no silver bullet. So as president, what would you be doing to protect hospital access and rural health care? No, yeah. Particularly maternal care is one thing that we're losing a lot of in rural areas yeah. in New Hampshire. Yeah, and you end up in a place where, look, 20% of the rural hospitals in the country are at risk of closure right now. States that didn't expand Medicaid have had a six, eight, six times greater closure rate uh, in rural hospitals than those that did. So I think that you got to recognize, and just like that crusty old rancher county commission said, if you lose that rural hospital, that town's gone. There are things that you can do at the state and federal level with um, critical access hospitals to provide different funding rates. You can actually bring technology. Um, our psychologists, you know, we've actually put together programs where we do uh, psychology from the our bigger town, Billings, but it's called Project Echo, and we build case groups all the way around because we also know that primary care physicians are often the folks that see somebody that's suicidal. I think taking dollars directly and saying that there's value in having, um, our, keeping our rural hospitals alive, so different payment formulas, uh, makes a lot of sense to incentivize, because if we lose those, all of our small towns are gonna be in that much more trouble. Next question comes from Marie Mulroy. Yes, hi, how are you? Welcome. Hi, yeah, I just, um, my question for you is, if you could only highlight one issue during your campaign, what would that be? Yeah, and what a great <laughs> question, Marie. <laughs> and because, you know, there's only a few issues out there. But, but that is, so I was Attorney General in this case called Citizens United came out. Mm -hmm. Citizens United's a case that equates money with speech and corporations with, with people. Court made that decision. Montana had this 100-year history. At one time, all of our st local, state, federal elections were bought by uh, these copper kings, these wealthy copper barons. Mark Twain talked about Montana and said, William Clark buys politicians <laughs> like most people buy food. By his example, corruption smells sweet in Montana. And Montanans took it back. They got rid of all corporate spending in 1912. And it, elections became about people talking to people. I'll try to speed this up. I took a case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, the first one after Citizens United, oh, nice. went down on a 4-3 decision. Always remember what a difference one justice on the Supreme Court can make for so many things that we believe. But then even with that two-thirds Republican legislature, passed a law that said if you're going to spend money in our elections in the last 90 days, you have to disclose where that money comes from. Never forget I'm running for re-election in 2016 and those dark money groups 91 days out had postcarded our whole state in ways that my kids looked at these and said, boy, you really aren't that good a guy, are you, Dad? <laughs> but on day 90, it stopped, right? right? And if we can stop the Koch brothers in Montana, we ought to be able to stop them everywhere else. I think income inequality is probably the issue facing us more than anything else. I think climate change. I think making health care work. But until we address that a billion dollars of undisclosed money has been spent even since Citizens United, the Washington, D.C. is captive to the donors. And at times, that's on both sides. And we've got to address that, and I think that we can address that to fix all the other issues that we need to address. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marie. Next question comes from Gay Jacques. Thank okay. you for your time, Governor. No, thank you. I have a 10-year-old uh, granddaughter with arthritis. Arthritis has a devastating effect on our nation. Research holds key to preventing controlling and curing arthritis, the leading cause of disability. Would you support arthritis research at the federal level? Yeah, yeah. and yeah, first, thank you for also sharing that, you know, I can't imagine as a 10-year-old yeah. um, the challenges that your yeah. grand, was it a grandson? Daughter. Granddaughter is going through that you kind of expect that my parents to have arthritis, but as a 10 year old. Yeah. And I think that we do need to, but in a greater sense, not just with arthritis. I mean, what we're seeing is more and more of a pullback under this administration when it comes to investing in the National Institute of Health, in investing in research and development, in investing in the opportunities to address some of these challenges that we have to make sure that your granddaughter can live a pain-free life. 
So I would certainly support both the investment, and I think we have to look at a greater sense of how at the federal government, we're spending less and less on really the, both the medical research and the research to keep America at the top of all of these areas. Thank so you thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Next question comes from Natalia Orlando. Oh, thank you. Hi, Governor. Thank you for being here. Um, just want to let you know I've been to Montana. It really is beautiful what sky country. Or do we don't have time to talk about that. We can do that. <laughs> no, probably not. I've been to all the states. I've traveled yeah. extensively and worked everywhere. Anyways, you, I'm sorry. I don't have a health care related question, but you probably knew this question was coming. Um, in a field where you have like thousands of Democratic candidates at this point, yeah. give me an incentive to vote for you. Why should I vote for you? Yeah, well. And Why do you stand out? Thanks for the question, Natalia. Anytime. I, <laughs> uh, I mean, I stand out, I think, because I'm literally the only one in this field that won in a state that Donald Trump won. And I think that we need to both not only bring out our base, but we also got to win back places that we lost. Anybody that thinks it's going to be enough just to be against Donald Trump, I think is mistaken. We need to actually be able to win back places we lost. We also have to give people a reason to vote for us, not just against him. You know, look, on the one hand, the economy's doing great. On the other hand, people are working harder today and making less. 40 years in America, the average worker hasn't had a real pay increase. Or you turn around and say, when I was growing up in the 70s, 90% of 30-year-olds were doing better than their parents were at age 30. Today, it's only half. The economy's not working for a whole lot of folks, and whoever cleans this, this room tonight will have paid more in taxes than 60 of the Fortune 500 companies last year who under the Trump tax cuts just got to walk. So I think I've been able to connect and win in those places. But I've also, this is a dangerous, from my perspective, a dangerous time of this 243 year experiment called representative democracy. We are more divided than any time in our nation's history. And forget about cable TV or Twitter. I mean, politics is dividing us at our Thanksgiving tables. And that's not the promise of America. So I also think I'm the only one in this field that's actually been able to demonstrate that you can bridge divides and get meaningful progressive policy done. I think I offer something by being outside of Washington, D.C. D.C.'s often become a place where talking about an issue is a substitute for doing something about the issue. And I think um, as a governor, as someone that, as an executive, that's actually had to do many of the things that we're talking about and do it in a way that can positively impact people's lives. I offer something significant from this field as well. Thank you, yeah, I agree with what you said. So you're saying I got your vote. <laughs> 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 we got from one undecided voter to, as you noted earlier, that you're on the list probably. Yeah. That's how it works in New Hampshire. Uh, quick follow on that though. Uh, so you have this standout quality of being elected in a uh, red state, essentially. Uh, the flip side of that, uh, right now uh, in the Democratic primary, it's important that uh, candidates represent uh, a diverse coalition of voters oh, within sure. the party. And Montana is not a very diverse state. So how do you speak to and energize those diverse coalitions coming from a place like Montana? No, it, it, and I think that how I do it, and yeah, it's really a fair question. About 10% of our population in Montana are people of color, the majority of them being American Indians or Native American. So we've got to address the fact that, like the opportunity that I had growing up, being raised in a single parent household, paycheck to paycheck, that opportunity no longer exists for a whole lot of people. And for a whole lot in this country, it never ever has. And in part, it's due to everything from slavery to discrimination to redlining. So I think that what we need to do is actually look at where all of these disparities are and address them and say, if you're African-American family, you make 58% of what, oh, on average, a white family does, or you're four times more likely to die in childbirth, and address those specific disparities. And the way that I'll do that is both, first of all, I show up, I listen more than I talk in these communities, I learn and say, let's take action together. At the end of the day, it's up to the voters to decide what we need. But I will be one that not only goes into the communities, but tries to learn and say that we need to give everybody a fair shot and recognizes for a whole lot of people they haven't had a fair shot in this country. 
Social media question coming in from uh, Karen Zelengowski. Sorry, Karen, if I messed that up. Uh, who is handling the office of governor while you're running for president? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Karen. <laughs> you know, it's funny. So I took my family on a five-day trip last summer where, and this isn't typical for the Bullock family, but we had to, uh, we did 25 miles on horses. Then we're in the middle of this Bob Marshall Wilderness area for five nights on the South Fork Flathead River. One of the most beautiful, especially when you have teenage daughters who don't think you're that cool and you, know, you, you need to disconnect. One of the most amazing things that I had ever uh, done. But I was also on a satellite phone every single day. This is a job where you can't just say, all right, I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to go be a father or even go to a kid's basketball game and you're not governor. Um, Every single day I'm engaged, whether I'm in Helena, Montana, or here in New Hampshire as governor. Every single day I'm having phone calls with my staff and making decisions. And it's been, it has been such a humbling blessing to get to do this for the last six years. So Karen can feel more than comfortable knowing that I'm in constant radio contact <laughs> in Montana and any significant decisions are made by me, not by somebody else. And I also have the challenges like, so I'll go for a few days, um, and guess what? You know where I'll be by Friday evening at 11 o'clock? I'll be at home, because I have four jobs. I have a job of governor, I have a job as a spouse, a father, and a presidential candidate. I need to do all four of those jobs at 100%. Another online question here coming from Matthew Lighthizer. What's your stance on marijuana policy? My stance on uh, marijuana policy, Matthew, and all of you, too, is that, look, I think that the federal government should get out of the way, meaning that right now you still have federal policies that would criminalize even what's going on in the state of Montana where we have a real good medical marijuana program, uh, that we've seen the positive impacts of medical marijuana, but at the same time that we have you know, the number one death of for 50, age 50 males and below is opioids. And I think that it should be a state by state decision what you do with legalization or medical marijuana. But the federal government shouldn't be what restricts that. We've got time for one last question here and let Just you explain. One last on one? This is one we've asked a lot We're of people. We're going to do three hours then today, okay? <laughs> okay, you guys this probably have things to do. Executive today. order to extend. <laughs> um, so, Talk about some uh, instance of adversity that you faced in your life that has made you a better leader. Yeah. Boy, that's a great question. Um, you know, I often say that, so I was raised by a single mom, parents divorced in grade school. Lived paycheck to paycheck. I only knew there was a governor's house in town because I delivered newspapers to it. So I've made it four blocks in life. Um, but yeah, so went to college sight unseen, the idea of college trips were well beyond and worked my way through college. I picked up my classmates' plates. I borrowed my way through law school. I think that gave me a perspective of, but somehow I still had that shot, right, of going from delivering newspapers to governor's house as a kid to raising my kids with my wife, our three kids, in it. And I think that at that level of sort of recognizing that everybody ought to be able to do better than their previous generation is something that um, has stuck with me all the way along. And I'll also say that uh, as part of that now and living at that house, like I'll never forget when, we, when I first got elected, we moved into the governor's house and my kids were six, eight, and 10. Youngest it had ever been as far as our 40 years of a governor with these kids. And my son kicks the soccer ball and it, bounces off this painting and somebody goes, you know, that painting's worth $250,000. I'm like, get rid of all the paintings, right? <laughs> but, but I ended up um, in the first day, of, my first day of the state, I said, you know, 40 years since kids this age have been, you're going to hear different noises. But as leaders, we have responsibility to recognize our kids learn from our words and our deeds. And it's time we start acting like our children are watching because they are. At some point, I believe that now more than ever before. And we have to ask, 
are we building a system that our kids can aspire to and be inspired by? At some point, this president's going to have to answer this, that question. At some point, every one of us running are going to. And at some point, you as the voters have to ask that same question. I do believe that we can bridge some of these divides and make a system better than uh, we certainly have right now. And that's why I'm doing this. All right. Governor Great. Steve Bullock, we thank you for joining us Thanks on a conversation so with the candidate. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you to our New Hampshire voters and all of you watching out there. Have a good night.